Carrier particles are the things that transmit a force back and forth between two matter particles, for example, between a neutron and a proton, or between an electron and a proton. The carrier part particles are specialized to each of the four forces. In the case of gravity, the carrier particle is called the graviton. It has a mass no, thought to be zero mega electron volts, and we'll talk about those units sometime in the future. For electricity and magnetism, the carrier particle is called the photon, denoted by a Greek letter gamma. It also is thought to be massless. The strong force is carried by a particle called the gluon, unfortunately carrying the same uh, symbol, uh, just an italicized G. It is a, a massless particle, but it's not the same thing as the graviton. The weak force is carried by actually a pair of particles, one of them called the W and the other the Z. The W has an electric charge in the sense of it feels the electromagnetic force, and the Z is neutral, neutral, electrically neutral. In other words, it doesn't feel the electrostatic force. These particles, however, are substantially heavier than the other carrier particles. They weigh either 80,000 in the case of the, the W or 90,000 in the case of the Z mega electron volts. For comparison, the proton weighs on the order of 900 mega electron volts, so these objects are truly huge. Carrier particles have really changed how we see forces in nature. In classical physics, we think about forces being transmitted at, via fields. In other words, I sitting over here emit a field of influence which exerts a force on you. This could be the gravitational field from me, this could be the electrostatic field from me, but we evaluate the field at a, at a distance and that field multiplied by some charge gives me the force on this other object like you. And in fact, we refer to action at a distance forces in classical physics. At the atomic level and in particle physics, however, we don't talk about action at a distance. We talk about the exchange of carrier particles. I, over here on the left, throw a carrier particle over to you on the right, and as a result of catching that carrier particle, you either feel the force of attraction or the force of repulsion. That's a little counterintuitive because if we think of this in, in a classical picture, if I threw a baseball at you at 90 miles an hour, you can, you can imagine the repulsive force because you would be pushed backwards by the momentum of that carrier particle. It's hard to imagine throwing something really fast at, at one's neighbor and having that neighbor be attracted toward me. So this is not an exactly uh, good model for, uh, for picturing this. But we should think of a carrier particle dancing back and forth, and it's that particle that exchanges information. But it does both the force of attraction and the force of repulsion. We graph this process very often with a two-dimensional graph where the vertical axis is separation and the horizontal axis is time. So an electron might be throwing off some energy in the form of a carrier particle as it marches along in time. This is actually sitting still and then it throws off a photon, which travels to the right in this picture, which, which means up in separation from the electron, which is going down, but to the right in time. That would be how we would graph the process of emitting some energy in the form of a photon. We could also graph what happens to an electron just innocently traveling along in time, and it, in comes a photon and gets captured by that electron and now I have an, an electron which is carrying more energy. Here might be the process of two particles bouncing. Electron coming near an electron. In other words, if the vertical direction here is separation and the horizontal axis is time, this is a picture where two electrons are coming up or approaching one another in time. Since the electrons have the same sign charge, they should repel, and the photon here is exchanged between them and so now they travel outward away from one another as they leave the interaction. Notice that I draw this photon straight up and down because often in the, in the case of describing this, this process we don't know if it's the lower electron that tossed the, the photon off which was captured by the upper electron or if it's the upper electron that tossed the photon off and was captured by the lower electron. We just draw it vertical like this as occurring at an instant in time although that's certainly not what's happening. Things like um, electrons being bound in atoms, or in other words, stuck to a nucleus at some distance, can be described by the exchange of carrier particles. 
And if we were to draw a little orbiting electron around the nucleus, we can envision photons traveling back and forth over and over again to keep that restoring force acting on the electron. In terms of these little pictographs, we would imagine an electron and a proton approaching an interaction where a photon was exchanged between them. And in fact, the very construction of protons and neutrons is accomplished by the exchange of carrier particles. The proton is two up quarks and a down quark. Each of these carries a color, and they exchange gluons back and forth to create an overall structure, one up which is red, one up which is blue, and one down which is green, or some other combination of colors, to create an overall color neutral object called the proton. And the same is true for a neutron or another proton over here. Nuclei are formed much the same way as atoms form together to make molecules. Even though the proton and the neutron are now neutral in the strong interaction, they can still attract nearby objects in a weaker way, much the same way that molecules form rather weakly compared to the binding energies of atoms themselves. These are sometimes, in, in the case of the atomic systems, called van der Waals forces, and there's no good name for it in the strong force, but this is how nuclei are formed. Imagine gluons, the stray gluons accidentally getting out of this proton and traveling over to a quark in that proton. That's much the same way how van der Waals forces create molecules out of atoms. Carrier particles often live for a very short time. Let's look at the process of emitting a force carrier particle again. For example, we talked about previously about the process of radioactive decay in which a neutron can decay to a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. This is called radioactive beta decay. This is a weak interaction process, and so a force carrier, the W, is involved. If you were to graph it, the neutron would be driving along, and at some point it would emit a W and it would turn into a proton. The W is unstable and it decays, and one way it can decay is to an electron and its neutrino. The mass of the proton, the electron, and the neutrino, when added together over here on the right, all sum to a number which is less than the neutron mass. So when the neutron is at zero kinetic energy and just sitting there on the table, all the energy it has to give up is its mass energy. And the process is allowed to take place because the energy required in the final state is less than the original energy available. However, for that moment in time when just the W and the proton are present and, it hasn't and the W has not decayed yet, we notice that energy conservation is violated because a rather light neutron has created a somewhat lighter proton but an incredibly heavy W. Its mass is 80 proton masses. How is that possible? That process occurs and is allowed by something called the uncertainty principle which we'll learn about later in this course. The uncertainty principle says that there's an amount of energy violation delta E which can take place or an amount by which energy conservation is allowed to be uncertain by an amount delta E as long as it takes place over a shortened time delta T which such that when the, the product of these two numbers delta E times delta T is a very small number called H or Planck's constant. This forces the W to only exist for a very short time and explains the incredibly short range of the weak interaction. In fact, this process occurs many places in nature. An electron we might like to think of as a straight moving object, and the uncertainty principle almost forbids this ideal picture. Once in a while, the electron emits some energy in the form of a photon. But because of energy conservation, that's not allowed, and the uncertainty principle only allows it to be, a short, to be present for a short time. Eventually, that photon is reabsorbed. But sometimes that process is even more elaborate. The, elect the photon is emitted and it splits into a particle and an antiparticle, the electron and the positron. Well, that's not allowed because they weigh more than what was available initially. In fact, now I have three particles. At this moment in time right here, I have an electron, a positron, and another electron. So that's three times as much mass as I had in the beginning. Surely I've violated energy conservation now. Well, again, the uncertainty principle only allows it to take place for a short ephemeral moment and eventually have to go back to having just an electron. Real particles, in fact, live in clouds, where there's somewhat complicated processes of electrons and photons and, and positrons all existing in a swarm around the original particle, 
but since each of them is only there for a short time, it's allowed by the uncertainty principle. And some of the more exciting experiments in physics is when you are able to perform experiments that probe at extremely short times, delta t, to see these rather dramatic fluctuations or violations of energy conservation.